All right, welcome to the evening worship service at Temple Heights Baptist Church. Let's open our hymnals to number 114, 114. His name is life. Here we go. His name is Master, Savior, Lion of Judah, Blessed Peers of Shepherd, fortress, rock of salvation, Lamb of God is He. Son of David, King of the ages, eternal life. Holy Lord of glory, His name is life. Sing it through one more time. His name is Master, Savior, Lion of Judah, Blessed Prince of Peace, Shepherd, Fortress, Rock of Salvation, Lamb of God is He, Son of David, King of the Ages, Good evening. I'm glad you guys all were able to return for tonight's service. I'm so glad you're here tonight and uh, getting out of the cold again. And so we get to worship the Lord and with song and in worship. Let's open in prayer. Dear Father, we just praise you for today. We praise you for all that you've done, Lord, and what a wonderful Sunday it's been, Lord. Lord, may you guide us uh, through uh, this week coming up, Lord. Lord, ask for blessings on, on our congregation, our church family, Lord. But Lord, be with us tonight. Lord, as we sing to you and worship you, Lord, Lord, and, uh, and pray for each other, Lord. Lord, we just thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Continuing in song unto the Lord, we're going to turn to number 473. This is one of our Christian theme songs, Victory in Jesus, 473. Here we go. I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me. With his redeeming blood, he loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the 473 on the second. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus <coughs> forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him. And all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath. And on the last, I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angels. 
shall sing ye and the old redemption story and some sweet day i'll sing up there the song of victory oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere i knew him and all my love is due him he plunged me to victory all right everybody let's stand up and greet each other Join me on that chorus. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory. Let's sing it again. Oh, God. Uh, hey, let's do it. Hey, I'm going for it. We'll fill it in for the third song. All right. Heard about a story how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory. We'll end it there. The uh, thought that I was going through was I was going to sing the whole song, but ah, the um, on the refrain, the thing that really caught me as we were singing the song was, of course, it says, oh, victory, we've got the victory in Jesus, my Savior, and then forever, so we have the eternal life. But the thing that got me was that, that next part. It says, he sought me. He sought me. I mean, hey, we're lost as can be. <laughs> And so as we're talking about the good shepherd and everything else, he sought us. He's the one that, that looked for me. And then it says, and then he bought me with his redeeming blood. So I just never get over it, right? <laughs> never get over it. All right, we'll sing the last song here. Three, we'll go to 329, 329. The Savior is waiting. The Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you let him come in? There's nothing in this world to keep you apart. What is your answer to him? Time after time he has waited before and now
going down the second. If you'll take one step toward the Savior, my friend, you'll find his arms open wide. Receive him and all of your darkness will end. Within your heart he'll abide. Time after time he has waited before and dissection of this just real quick um it says the savior is waiting it's got a dotted part there waiting he's waiting wow how did they think of this when they're writing but then it says to enter your heart and this is why don't you let him and it you know it's extended on that word him come in and there's nothing in this world to keep you out. What is your answer to him? But uh, there's another part. But when it says waiting, though, he's waiting. I'll just leave it there. Amen, Lord. Well, brother, we're waiting for the hymn that God gives you to write so we oh, can. He's teaching you. He's teaching you. Oh, my. Well, it's been a good day. And. Uh, Glad we get to close the day out with God's word. Let's pray. Dear Father, we just thank you again for today. Lord, uh, may uh, your word just come to light to us. And Lord, may you speak mightily through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to continue on in Psalms 119. Uh, of course, this is the longest chapter in the Bible. How many verses are there in it? No. 176. 176. Verses. So it's taking us a little time to get through this psalm. Um, so we're uh, going to do this. Now, Now, what's unique about this psalm? It's the, it's the alphabet. Yeah, it's written out of the Hebrew alphabet in different stanzas. How long is each stanza? Eight verses. Eight verses. So eight times and how many letters there are in the Hebrew alphabet? 22. 22. I think I heard a little mouse over here, 22. Yes, 22 uh, Letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Could anybody name the first seven letters? <laughs> you can't read them because they're in Hebrew or because you can't see the English transliteration. <laughs> Aleph, Beth, Gimel, Galeth, He, Val, Vain. So the first... They're not in the alphabetic order according to our alphabet, yes, but this is the Hebrew alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet. And so each stanza, so each of the eight verses start with that particular letter of that stanza's letter. And so that's kind of kind of interesting. Really, it's just uh, intriguing. It doesn't really carry over to uh, English. It's clearly, you can see each stanza starts with a different letter in the English, in the English alphabet. So we've gone through the first six um, stanzas. Uh, and what, what's the theme of Psalm 119? What was that? Wisdom? The Bible. the Bible, right? It's focusing on the Bible. It's praising God's word. And, you know, Psalms 119, so everything is focusing and returning back to God's word. It's like, oh, Peter, Pastor Peter, we're going to be doing this again, the same theme again. Well, yes. And, you know, I've been encouraged through the week knowing the, the, we don't know who the author is, but the author is, he's just like us. He has his ups and downs and he struggles, but he always comes back to God's word. And he's always the foundation to, to everything. And he goes back and continues to praise God's word. I think we need that. We need that. And so it's not old. It's not old, even though we may say, uh, repeat ourselves a couple, couple times. All right, so the, just as a quick uh, review, the first uh, stanza left dealt with uh, the blessings on those who wholeheartedly obey God's word. The second stanza, Beth, uh, focuses on the word of God cleanses us. The third one, uh, Gemel, shows the appreciation of God's word, how much we appreciate God's word. The fourth one, the left, uh, is prayers for understanding God's word. The fifth one, he, uh, is loyalty to God's word. Uh, the sixth stanza of vow 
is God's word provides salvation. And so now we're on the seventh letter, vain. Um, and this one, this theme of this particular stanza is hope for, from God's word. Hope from God's word. So in Psalms 119, verse 49, Psalms 119, verse 49, Remember the word unto thy servant upon which thou caused me to hope. And he, the author, again, we don't know who the author is, but he counts himself as a servant uh, to the Lord. And so he's following the Lord and he's saying, remember the word unto thy servant, remember the Lord word unto me, which, upon which thou hast caused me to hope. God's word gives us hope, right? When we've lost all hope, God's word provides that hope. God's word provides that hope. And he's going to, his word for that hope. Verse 50, this is my comfort in my affliction, for thy word hath quickened me. God's word renews us. It comforts us when our, in our trials and tribulations, in our, in our sad days. It provides us comfort, and it provides us with renewal. That word quickening me, it's coming back to me and comforting me, uh, renewing me, quickening me, guiding me. God's word renews us. The proud have, have had me greatly in derision. The proud have had me greatly in derision. Doesn't the world cause us to be, go, our heads go swirling and, and it's just all this chaos out there. And yet have I not declined from thy law. And yet I have not declined. No matter what's going on in the world, no matter how troubling the world is, the word of God is there. And he's not declining. He's not removing from God's word. He's not removing himself from the law. He's not going to turn from it. I remember, verse 52, I remembered thy judgments of old, O Lord, and have comforted myself. I remember the judgments of old. As we've gone through, uh, well, in, in Sunday school, we were going through the uh, dispensations. We went all the way back to Adam and Eve and through Noah and uh, through Abraham that's old, right? Uh, we're studying things that have happened long, long ago. Those things, and we see God's faithfulness back then, and we know he's faithful today. And so I remember thy judgments of old. I remember thy commandments. I remember thy promises of old, O Lord. And those words comfort me. God's words comforts us. Verse 53, all horror hath taken hold upon me because of the wicked that forsake thy law. Isn't it upsetting when we see the world turn away from God's word? And now we see that the world itself is shaking its fist right in God's face. It's no longer things done in secret and private in the dark. It's out there in the open. And now what's good is now bad and what's bad is now good. And that causes distress, horror, I mean, you, you think about the different things that have been going on in the world today, and you're like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> I can't even believe we're even talking about this and trying to define this when clearly God has defined it since the beginning of time. So the world makes us upset as they disregard God's word. Apparently, nothing's changed, has it, from when he wrote Psalms 119. Thy statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. The word of God brings us song, right? Song brings us joy. We love to sing about, about our Lord and Savior. It gives us song. I have remembered thy name, O Lord, in the night and have kept thy law. What happens at night? Is that when you're all alone and by yourself and it's dark and, you know, Nothing really good happens at night, right? Particularly if you're outside your home and you're out and about. You don't want to be out there at night. But, you know, nighttime is you're looking for the morning. You're looking for that sunrise in the morning. And here the psalmist is saying, I have remembered thy name, O Lord, in the night. And that the word of the Lord provides that comfort, provides that security and that peace and comfort in the time of time of distress when you're by yourself in the night. He remembers God's word. This I had because I kept thy precepts. This I had because I kept thy precepts. He's, he's comforted because he's kept the law. He has the law. He's hidden the word of God in his heart. 
All right, the eighth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, what's that letter? Chef. Of course, we're in the slaughter of the alphabet, aren't we? <laughs> het. Het. In this section, this stanza has to do with obedience to God's word. Obedience to God's word. Thou art my portion, verse 57. Thou art my portion, O Lord, I have said that I would keep thy word. Thou art my portion. He's my security. The Lord's our security. And he's determined to follow his commands. I have said I would keep thy commands. He make a conscious decision to follow the Lord. The Lord has provided him security. Protection is within his boundaries that he set up, right? God's word, God's law has thou shalt do this, thou shalt not do that. And many may say, well, this is very, um, keeps us, doesn't allow us to do things. Well, allows you to have freedom. And I can testify to this because when we uh, had our backyard and there's a pond in our back behind our house, uh, when uh, William and Johnson, well, Johnson was just born and William was two, there was no fence. And there's alligator in the pond. And so we'd have to go out and watch them as they ran around, as this you know, two-year-old runs around. And then we put up a fence. It actually provided them more freedom because they had a boundary to stay with inside. And they could roam around, and uh, Lori could go inside and do whatever she's doing and know for sure that they are OK, because they were inside the boundaries. Uh, I understand I didn't know this, but Christian went outside those boundaries. We stayed over at the house on Saturday. And I was wondering why I was putting shoes, getting his shoes, why his shoes were wet. Because they, apparently, he uh, was trying to grab a ball that went over the fence and rolled into the pond, and he was trying to get the, the ball and stepped into the pond. And I understand Matthew was distracted while he was trying to protect Christian from falling in. Or, so anyway, God's word provides those boundaries, right? God's word provides liberty because we know what is safe to stay within. And if we go, we go outside those boundaries, that's when we get in trouble. And that's where there, the effects of sin and the cause of sin then has a ripple effect, not only us, but on, on the world. Remember, we, um, those in Sunday school, we talked about Adam and Eve. God set up a boundary and actually put a boundary around the one tree they were allowed to eat. They were allowed to do everything else but eat the tree. Well, they crossed the boundary that they weren't have, and that one sin of eating of the fruit has had a ripple effect. We're all affected by that one act, aren't we? So going outside those bounds has a ripple effect. Uh, Christian shoes were wet. <laughs> 58, verse 58. I entreated thy favor with, thy, with my whole heart. My merciful, be merciful unto me according to thy word. I have asked, the psalmist is asking for blessings, for protection, for provisions, he's entreating thy favor. He's asking for God's goodness, and he's doing it with all his heart. He's pleading for God with all his heart. He's relying on him. He's going to the one source that can provide all these things, and he's asking, be merciful according to thy word. Be merciful according to thy word, meaning I know your promises. I'm relying on those promises. You promised you provide for my needs. You promised for my protection. You promised. I'm relying on your promises according to your word. Psalms 419 says, but my, but my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. God promised to supply all your needs, not all your wants, but all your needs. Romans 828, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Even though we don't understand why, I mean, we have two car accidents that occurred, I don't know, was the same day, potentially the Bucks had, I think we're in a car accident as well. Friday. Friday. Saturday. Saturday night, okay. Uh, we don't... We don't understand. We don't know why. But uh, for some reason, God will cause good to come out of these issues. Verse 59, I thought on my ways and turned my feet unto thy testimonies. What is the psalmist doing? I thought on my ways. It's like, huh, I don't think I'm going in the right direction. I'm examining myself. 
I'm examining myself. You ever go down a trail and uh, you know you're looking? If you're in the in the forest uh, and you're on a trail, they'll put like dots on trees, and sometimes after a while, you're like, I don't see any dots anymore. <laughs> Maybe I missed it somewhere, and you start examining. Am I on the right trail? Uh, hopefully, I see a dot soon, or else I better turn around and go back to the last time I found that post. You know, whatever they call those rules, markers, trail markers. And so here we have, he's examining himself. So we need to examine ourselves. Are you doing what the Lord says? Maybe you need to get back on track. Maybe you need to turn and follow him. Because here he says, turn to my feet unto thy testimonies. I've turned my feet unto your word. I'm getting back on track. I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. Well, as soon as God pricks your heart and says, Oh, uh, you have made a mistake. You better turn around. Don't delay. Don't delay. Listen to him, right? The more you say, no, 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 I'm not ready. To, I don't want to do that. The more you harden your heart against him saying, no, nope, come back, come back. Don't delay. Obey now. The bands of the wicked have robbed me. I have what I have not forgotten. Thy word. The bands of the wicked have robbed me. Doesn't the world, the wickedness out there, rob us of, of joy when we take our eyes off the Lord? But he has not forgotten the word. Train up a child, in verse Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart for it. We're praying. We've got, and I'm, I've talked to many parents, and, you know, some Christian homes, they're doing well, and others, they've, the child has totally turned away from the Lord, and, Lord, as parents, we've done, we've trained. Lord, may they not forget your precepts, your law, and Lord, may you turn them back to it. And so we're relying on that as promises. And here we have the psalmist, the bands of the wicked have robbed me. When you go away from the Lord, you get robbed, don't you? But I have not forgotten thy law. The psalmist was trained and known God's word, and he's turning back to it. At midnight, verse 62, I will rise to give thanks to thee because of thy righteous judgments. I am a companion of them that all fear thee and of them that keep thy precepts. I am a companion of all of them that fear thee. I'm friends with brothers and sisters in Christ and of them that keep, thy, keep God's word. Your best friends are right here. The ones that are trusting in God's word and fellowshipping together. Hebrews 10.25, not forsaking the assembling of others together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. It's so important to, to be together, to be together with those who are love God's word and worshiping the one true God. Verse 64, the earth, O Lord, is full of thy mercy. Teach me thy statutes. Teach me thy statutes. You can just see the psalmist as he's writing and relying on God's word. What's the eighth letter of the Hebrew alphabet? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What? I want the ninth letter? Teth? Oh, I just did eight. I'm miscounting. Teth. This stanza is trust in God's word. Trust in God's word. This 56, 65, excuse me, 65. Thou hast dealt well with thy servant, O Lord, according to thy word. Do you trust that God will keep his promises? This is what the psalmist is saying. You have dealt, you've, you've never faulted on your promise. God will deal God deals with this according to his law. You know what? He wrote this, and we, we think he's put boundaries around us. He's also put boundaries around himself, right? I'm going to do this. He's putting boundaries around himself, isn't he? He put it in writing, kind of like a contract, that this is what I'm going to do for you when you obey. This is what I'm going to do to you if you disobey. He put boundaries around himself on what he will and will not be doing. And the psalmist is saying, you've done what you've said. You know, is your word your law, your vow? Do you say? I've had 
um, visitors come in, says, I'll see you next Sunday. I'll see you on Wednesday. I don't see them. <laughs> you, is, do you mean what you say and you do what you mean? You say what you mean? We have a God who does what he says he's going to do. So do you trust that God will keep his promises? God is dealing with you on what he has written right here. God will never deviate from his law. He will never add fine print to his law. I'm sure we have all been in that position. You get that, that insurance policy and you think you're covered. And when the actual event occurs, then they're like, uh, no, that doesn't apply here. Well, look at this fine print. Like, okay. We got a, a couch and, uh, you know, we were sold on. If there's even a scratch on the couch, you can get a new couch. Uh, no. <laughs> For one thing, the insurance company got sold a couple times, so who knows how to retrieve this particular policy. Uh, and the other thing you had to do was it had to, you had to record the, the event that occurred to be able to notate that this event, that this scratch occurred at this time and therefore this tear and then there you turn that in and you get a new couch, a couch replacement. Well, I have boys. We harm couches, but it takes time. It's a, something that happens over time. Apparently that is not accounted for in the warranty policy. God doesn't have fine print. He lays it right out here. He lays it there. He's never going to add to his law and do something different. What he says, he will do. We can trust in that. Verse 66, teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I have believed thy commandments. If God is going to keep the law and he's going to bless us and judge us according to his law, maybe we should know his law. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. God chastens those who are being disobedient. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. Notice he went astray, and then he was afflicted. He went astray, did something that he shouldn't have been done, and God chastened him. A father loves his child when he chastens him. God, our Heavenly Father, loves us, so he chastens us. And he brings us back here. And so before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. So he's, God reigned him back in, so I'm back on track. I'm keeping your word. Thou art good and dost good. Teach me thy statutes. Thou art good. In other words, God always keeps his promises. Teach me thy statutes. We find he is patient and merciful with us. The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep thy precepts with my whole heart. Even in the midst of slander, does he determine to stay in God's law? Even when the world's saying evil things about us or trying to trip us up, he still keeps God's law. You know, we need Psalms 119 so we don't get discouraged because he's already been through it. We can see he stayed with it. We also need to stay with it. Their heart is fat as grease, but I delight in thy law. It is good for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. Notice this. He's praising the Lord for the afflictions. It is good that I have been afflicted. Anybody want to say that? It is good that mommy and daddy spanked me. It is good that mommy and daddy punished me. Anybody want to? Guys, you want to say that? I don't see it happening. Anyway, this guy is saying it is good that the Lord has chastened me. Praise the Lord for his chastening. Do you praise the Lord for his trials and tribulations? It may take a little bit to remind us to do that, not at the first instant. Uh, you're probably not in the car accident and praising the Lord when you get out of the car, are you? <laughs> It may take a little bit of time, but that, that's what we need to be really doing. God is in control. This allows us to see his statutes are real and provide for our protection. 
that God is good for giving afflictions to us. Verse 72, the law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. As he just as he's dwelling on God's word, he recognizes the value of the Bible, the value of God's word. What's the value of this? Was it American Express had the commercial where um, something's worth a dollar and then something's worth five dollars, but this is priceless? This is priceless. He values it above gold and silver, thousands of gold and silver. He recognized the value of God's word more and more, even so more in the times of trials. Proverbs 3.13, happy is the man that findeth wisdom. Wisdom is God's word. And the man that getteth understanding for the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver and the gain thereof than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies and all the things thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. There's nothing you can compare to God's word. Proverbs 8.10, Receive my instruction and not silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. If you had a choice between a billion, a trillion, what comes after a trillion? Quadrillion dollars? This is more valuable. Receive my instruction and not silver for knowledge rather than choice gold for wisdom is better than rubies and all the things that can be desired are not to be compared to it. Proverbs 16, 6, how much better is it to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding rather be chosen than silver? How much do you value God's word? Is it priceless to you? All right, what's the next letter in the Hebrew alphabet? Did I miscount? I'm on 10. The 10th letter. Jod, this stanza is about hope in God's word. Hope in God's word. Verse 73, thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. The author acknowledges that God made him. Thy hands have made me and fashioned me. We are a creation of God. Psalms 100, verse 3, Know ye that the Lord, he is God, for he it is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pastures. William went to the March for Life uh, rally in Washington, D.C., and froze with <laughs> several uh, tens of thousands of others who came. Uh, they, uh, he told me that he, they marched to the Supreme Court but uh, didn't stop there because the Supreme Court has already made their decision. They've gone now to standing in front of the Capitol uh, because the Capitol is where, they, where the focus is on legislation. But God has made us. God values life. He made us and formed us. Psalms 139, verse 14, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Genesis 127, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. We talked about this morning how we need to respect all people. Why? Because God himself fashioned each and every one. Praise the Lord, he didn't recreate me, right? When we're all uniquely and wonderfully made. And maybe we're a little different from each other. Look at God's creation. He formed that individual in the image of himself. And if we dare criticize and, and say mean things about that person, we're talking about what God created. Be careful. Job 10, 8. Thine hands have made me and fashioned me together round about, yet thou dost destroy me. And we can talk about Job at a later time and what was happening with Job. But Job's recognizing, you have made me. Jeremiah 1, 4. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before we even uh, thought in mom and dad's eyes, the Lord knew us. 
And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. And here it's specifically pointing out that Jeremiah was ordained to be a prophet to the nations. Before you were born, God ordained you for his wonderful will. This wonderful purpose. You have a purpose, and God designed you specifically for that purpose. Isaiah 43, 7, Even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory, I have formed him, yea, I have made him. And so we have the psalmist, Thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. It might be nice if we go to the owner's manual on what we're supposed to be doing. Verse 74, they that fear thee will be glad when they see me because I have hoped in thy word. We love to be around other brothers and sisters in Christ. It gives us gladness to know. There's a, a certain feeling when you're around a fellow Christian. It feels like you've known them all your entire life. And I've mentioned this before. When you, even when you go on, away on a mission trip, you go to a foreign country and you walk into a church, you feel like you've always been there. And I pray that uh, whenever we have visitors come here, they feel like they're at home as soon as they walk in the doors. And please, make sure you take an effort to make sure they feel at home. Um, so they that fear thee will be glad when they see me, because I have hoped in thy word. Verse 75, I know, O Lord, thy judgments are right, that thou in faithfulness hast, af hast afflicted me. God is righteous in all that he does, even when it seems like you're being treated poorly. The world, or the world I've had, you know, I'll tell different people at work, oh, this is what happened, you know, I'm just stating a fact, this has happened. It's like, wow, you've had a string of bad luck. <laughs> uh, no, and it's just God doing his wonderful will. It's like, what did you do wrong? Verse 76, let, I pray thee, thy merciful kindness for my, be for my comfort. According to thy word unto thy servant, let thy tender mercies come unto me that I may live, for thy law is my delight. His word, his mercy comforts us. Let the proud be ashamed, for they dealt perversely with me without a cause, but I will meditate in thy precepts. Let them be ashamed, but I'm going to stick with God's word. Let those out there who are going against God be ashamed. 1 Corinthians 1, 27, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. God does some amazing things. It's sometimes laughable, isn't it? Verse 79, Let those that fear thee turn unto me, and those that have known thy testimonies. Let my heart be sound in thy statutes, that I be not ashamed. May our testimony be seen. May people come to know the Lord because of our lives, as we've talked about this morning. May we keep God's laws that we won't be ashamed. He's keeping us in the boundaries of safety. And may we not cause others to stumble or turn away from God. All right, I think our time is up, and we want to take some time for prayer. And so we'll continue on with what? what's the next letter we're going to talk about? Calf. Calf. All right, we'll talk about calf. We're not quite halfway through Psalms 119, so aren't you excited? We have a couple more weeks. <laughs> All right, let's close in prayer. Dear Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your blessings, Lord. Lord, we thank you for your word, and Lord, how it's more valuable than gold. And Lord, do we treat it like that? Lord, may we do so. We thank you that it's a comfort to us in those dark night hours, and Lord, that it's a a, a a place that gives us boundaries so that we can succeed and be used of you, Lord. Lord, may we rely on your word. We praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.